Many Americans are very critical of their elected officials in Washington, and perhaps rightly so, because of the inability to reach consensus on balancing the budget and stimulating the economy. Now, the U.S. Econ economic recovery has been agonizingly slow, but it, that is not unexpected, considering the size of the body blow that it took. It is a sobering fact that the net home equity in American homes declined from $12.9 trillion during the housing bubble in 2007 to $6.2 trillion in 2011. A total of $6.7 trillion in household wealth was instantly vaporized. And to put this into perspective, that amount represents more than the gross domestic product of China in 2010. And so this severe setback represents an important reason that U.S. new vehicle sales have risen only modestly in the past two years. Now, notwithstanding the magnitude of the setbacks that the economy as a whole and the automotive sector in particular suffered in 2008 and 2009, the rebuilding of the U.S. automotive business over the past three years has been driven by a profound sense of responsibility coupled with extraordinary determination and resolve by everyone who was involved in the process, trade unions this time included. The end result of this painful reconstruction has been good. We've seen the pace of new vehicle sales pick up in the past few months, with one factor being replacement demand as the average age of vehicles on American roads is now at an all-time record of more than 10 years. Now, there are several other reasons for optimism about 2012, with consumer confidence creeping up and employment recovery beginning to gain momentum. Home sales are rising as is spending on durable goods and especially in the car business. So the trend is upbeat, even if total vehicle sales will still remain below pre-recession levels. 26 months ago, when the new Chrysler Group re revealed its five-year plan, we actually forecast a U.S. market of 12.7 million vehicles in 2011. And the final number, as I understand it, came in at 12.8, close enough for horseshoes and for hand grenades. And our plan, for, plan forecast for 2012 sees a number of 13.7 million vehicles for the current year. So if I get this close to the projected SAR right two years in a row, I am going to give up my job. I will not follow Automotive News' advice for 2012 or staying away from forecasts. And I will open up a fortune telling business called 1-800-CALL-SERGIO. Now, not too many years ago, the U.S. industry looked at 16 million as a permanent fixture in the landscape. And yet it endured a level of industrial inefficiency that yielded negative margins in the sale of vehicles with positive margins coming from related activities such as financing. Now, in response to the recession in North America, all the play players found the courage to make transformational change. Automakers, government suppliers, and labor faced up to the need to create a leaner, more competitive paradigm. And during the restructuring of the industry, every ounce of unnecessary capacity was taken out of the system. The U.S. industry has been retooled to the extent that, speaking at least for Chrysler and probably for the other two Detroit players, we can all survive at a 10 million SAR. Making and selling great cars is once again at the center of our business, as it should be. The important thing is to maintain the discipline that the restructuring forced on us in 2008 and 2009. And while the pace of America's economic bounce back may be disappointing to some, you need to realize that you don't always have to be good looking to win a beauty contest. Sometimes just being the least ugly person on the podium is enough. <laughs> and that is why the U.S. today looks very attractive compared with a slowdown on emerging markets and the crisis that is crippling Europe. The real problem that we face right now on a global scale is Europe. 
the euro crisis, the currency itself, and the alleged union that it represents are clearly the single largest issues that is causing nervousness in markets around the world. Now, even though the European community is facing one of the most difficult periods since the formation of the Union itself, the political priority for many member states is to resolve their internal issues. This focus on narrow national interests creates the serious risk of destroying the dream of unity and of solidity upon which the European Union was founded. We keep on hearing political leaders saying that they are willing to embrace financial rigor and discipline, but we have yet to see how these austerity plans will be carried out. Some tough medicine will need to be part of the solution. And it's an issue that we're watching very carefully to understand the risk or the risks that it poses to the market in general and to the auto sector in particular. The fallout from a European recession could not be confined. It was spread to North America, impacting banks and ultimately leading to a tightening of the credit policies as well as to a decline in U.S. exports to the Eurozone. We can only make contingency plans to deal with the consequences and hope that we get a timely resolution. But I think we need to remember that the current state of affairs also offers Europe a great opportunity to transform its structure, to take its future into its own hands, to choose the path of political and of economic union in addition to monetary union, and to finally delineate a clear and a well-defined arrangement that can sustain a prosperous future. When Chrysler underwent its, its rebirth and enter, entered into an alliance with Fiat in June 2009, Chrysler was barely off um, a life support system and it was the U.S. economy that was an outright disaster. And yet by 2011, less than three years later, Chrysler was back in the black with operating profit expected to re exceed $2 billion. And our sales and market share have shown significant gains in both the U.S. and Canada. And also independent surveys confirm the quality of our products has markedly improved. The company paid back every cent of its U.S. and Canadian government loans with interest. And six years ahead of the expected repayment date, rewarding the faith shown in us and freeing us ultimately to chart our own destiny. The payback also cleared the way for Fiat to acquire a majority stake in Chrysler and the formation of a single leadership team for Fiat Chrysler. And because of the weakness of the European auto sector, it was Fiat's Brazilian operations and the profits from Chrysler that have now helped sustain Fiat. In less than three years, the tables have turned as far as the regional economies go. But the underlying rationale for the partnership remained the same, to create the mass and the efficiencies demanded by global competition. The U.S. recession provided critical impetus to address structural issues that the industry had dragged behind for years, issues such as wastefulness, brand-destroying marketing strategies, and the root of all of it, which was chronic overcapacity. The Fiat Chrysler relationship is a response to the mutual opportunity designed to create value by leveraging the unique benefits of each group, benefits that can only be achieved by bringing them together. Europe, unfortunately, has failed to come to grips with overcapacity and is in denial over the reality that the natural level of sales will be lower in the next several years. As Fiat and Chrysler go forward, our international presence will help us to remain flexible and to take advantage of changing conditions in different markets, giving us the alternatives to supply production as long as we can maintain the same level of manufacturing integrity throughout the system. From the very beginning, we believe that Fiat and Chrysler offered unique benefits to each other and that we could achieve possibilities that would elude either one of us alone. Fiat provided Chrysler with technical know-how and important leadership skills honed from its own recovery from a near-death experience just a few years earlier. 
and Chrysler's leadership proved to be equally courageous in embracing the challenge to shape their own future. They understood the need for step changes in productivity, in quality and speed of execution, and to refuse to engage in marginal improvements. For Chrysler's leadership team, this regaining or reimagining of the future meant going beyond long-time habits and traditional paths. The first thing that we did was to flatten out the organization like it had never, done, never been done before in order to create an incredibly fast-moving team. Leaders took on broad spans of control to expedite decision-making, and about two dozen people report directly to me as the CEO. We began implementing world-class manufacturing, or WCM, which was pioneered by Fiat and which has provided a true step change that is based on a maniacal desire to remove waste from our production processes. And WCM represents a radical change on the factory floor and its success in improving safety, efficiency, and quality relies on the intelligence and experience and the creativity of the people who work in our plants.